Well, folks, we have a great episode for you today. Before I let you know what, or more appropriately, who will be on the show this week, I did promise you an announcement. Well, here it is. Earlier this month, I filed my official appointment of a campaign treasurer in my bid to become the representative for District 12 here in Tennessee. I'm doing it once again. Most of you may know this as I included the introduction in the show for nearly a year now that I was a prior candidate. But what has changed now is I will be seeking the Republican Party nomination in the August 2024 primary. As it stands currently, there's only one other person that has decided to throw their hat in the ring for the GOP nomination. And you can be sure that we'll be discussing that individual as well as any others that decide to jump in now between now and February as well. Of course, as you know, last time I ran for office, I had to run as an independent candidate, and that was based upon the state GOP bylaws, which defines who is or who is not what they call a bona fide Republican. Well, I meet those requirements now. Even after the Tennessee GOP State Executive Committee amended those bylaws once again this past summer, Now, what I hope is that this will alleviate some of the issues with voter apathy that is rampant in our nation right now. The apathy where the voters only vote along party lines and do not take the time to investigate every candidate running for office. Now, I must let you know, I have voted Republican my entire life. And despite many of the shortcomings about the National and Tennessee Republican Party that I point out quite frequently on this show, I only vote Republican because that party's stated platform most closely aligns with our nation's and our state's constitution. If you are a longtime listener to this show, you also know exactly how I feel and what I believe about the modern Democrat Party. Make no bones about it, they are straight-up communists. Communists that want to, in the words of their dear leader, fundamentally transform our republic into what that belief system, communism, what that belief system always does to countries around the world. Communism transforms countries into tyrannical hellholes where freedom and liberty and self-governance are taken away from the citizens. Between now and election day, I will plug in bits of my campaign here on the show as I continue to discuss how we must continuously fight to maintain our liberty. And those fights are increasingly against our own government instead of foreign adversaries. Some of the episodes on liberty will shine a light on exactly how all levels of government are seeking to erode our liberty. We will still discuss the leadership needed to restore our constitutional republic, as well as provide examples of good and bad people in leadership positions, both in and out of government. And of course, we will continue to discuss the lies that people in positions of power and influence spread every day so that they can maintain those same positions. What I need you to do now, my dear listeners, is this. Head over to the website libertyleadershipandlies.com and subscribe to the blog there. You can also follow me on all of my social media accounts as well. Most importantly, you can share this show with all of your friends and contacts as well as donate to my campaign. Every little bit will help. With that, on today's episode, we will be welcoming back a returning guest. This person has demonstrated resolve and leadership in the fight against government, both state and federal, in the government's attempts to deprive our citizens of their constitutionally protected right to keep and bear arms. Mr. John Harris of the Tennessee Firearms Association joins the program this week to discuss a wide range of topics, and more importantly, how my fellow Tennesseans can exercise leadership in the arena in the defense of our rights. So stay tuned, and let's get on with the show. Welcome to a show where we will discuss how the citizens of this republic must continuously fight to maintain our liberty. And those fights are increasingly against their own government. Some of the episodes on liberty will shine a light on exactly how all levels of government are seeking to erode our constitutionally protected rights. We will also discuss the leadership needed to restore our constitutional republic, as well as providing examples of good and 
bad people in leadership positions in all facets of our society. Additionally, we will discuss the lies that people in positions of power and influence spread every day so they can maintain those same positions. I'm your host, Larry Lynn, retired U.S. Navy veteran, small business owner, and candidate for the Tennessee House of Representatives. And this is the Liberty Leadership and Lies podcast. And today we're welcoming just Mr. John Harris of the Tennessee Fire Association of the Liberty Leadership and Lies podcast. Once again, he's our favorite guest and he's going to talk about things that just went on in the special session and what we need to do going forward to actually get constitutional carry here in Tennessee. And, and with that, John, I'll just give it over to you again to introduce yourself and we get into the program. Thank you. <laughs> I am a uh, practicing attorney in Nashville. I've been practicing law for about 37 years now. And a portion of my practice involves representing individuals and businesses and disputes with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which includes firearms manufacturers, um, gun dealers, people in the retail distribution side, uh, individuals with NFA trusts, and then also explosives companies. So I do a fair amount in those areas, but it's by no means the bulk of my practice. Uh, it's just that there aren't many attorneys that practice in the ATF realm at all. And then in addition to that, for 28 years now, I have served in a volunteer capacity as the executive director for the Tennessee Firearms Association. And that's all volunteer donated effort. And it's what gets me far more interviews than my law practice uh, as a practical matter. Right. Because I think we need somebody like that or like yourself in the in the arena fighting for what it really means, the Second Amendment, its true meaning. And we really appreciate that. So uh, let's talk about the special session that just recently could be. Could you give the audience just a real definition of what a red flag law really is? Absolutely. Uh, a red flag law is a catch-all term that is used to describe any type of statutory structure that seeks to predict who might commit a crime in the future, sort of like the movie Minority Report. And then it wants to go out and, and intervene to try to make sure that that potential criminal activity doesn't occur. So the theory is with red flag laws is that the government in its immense expertise has the ability to predict who has mental health or emotional or anger management issues that it can then issue orders to its officials, basically the police, to go out and seize the individual's firearms in the delusional belief that by doing so, that person is not going to potentially commit a crime or they're not going to commit a crime as violent as what they might otherwise commit if they had possession of a weapon. And so red flag laws are these uh, predictive types of uh, intercession designed to uh, make society feel comfortable that potentially bad people or potentially bad conduct can be stopped by early intervention. And really, it's, it's a taking away the due process rights, isn't it, as well? In most instances, yes, due process is, is completely violated, uh, in large part because we're talking about a constitutionally protected right. We're talking about the only item of personal property that is specifically to, protected to civilian ownership by the Constitution, and yet the government thinks that it has the wherewithal, the authority to come in and interrupt that protected right by seizing property, seizing assets, without the benefit even of a criminal trial to find out if you've committed a crime or if you've lost your eligibility. These oftentimes red flag laws happen ex parte in some states where you don't even get notice of the hearing until it's occurred. They just show up knocking at your door, seizing weapons. Right. And in and, Je and uh, Governor Lee's proclamation, when he called for the special session, he put some kind of caveats in there and what it read like to me is that even if they did seize this, it would cost the citizen time, effort, and money in trying to 
you know, debate that red flag law in a court of law before, I mean, no, post them seizing his firearms, his or her firearms. It depends on, so we never finally saw what he wanted in the special session. He did introduce some legislation back in April or circulated some proposed legislation that didn't get filed. And under that proposal, there would be an ex parte proceeding that would initiate the process, but the actual seizure of the weapons wouldn't have been allowed until after there was a hearing. But there were a lot of problems with that because, for example, the hearing was required to occur within three to five days. Uh, you know, you had to go out and hire your own attorney within that short period of time. It wasn't clear if it was calendar days or what do you do about weekends or holidays. And you potentially had to submit to the... Uh, assessment, the medical evaluation of a state paid expert with no real ability to go out and hire your own expert to get an assessment to come in as rebuttal proof right? within the three to five day window. And then the order could be put in place for as much as 180 days, and it could be extended continuously, indefinitely, depending on the discretion of the hearing officers. Right. And that all cost the private citizen time and money to go into that time and money. And and for example, there are other collateral consequences. I mean, could you imagine in the employment environment it, it, that it might become a question because this was not precluded in the proposed legislation that employers would start asking, are, are you the subject of one of these disposition orders? Are you the subject of a red flag order? You, they may not want to employ somebody that has one of those types of orders pending against them. Right. Uh, so there's nothing for the benefit, all to the detriment of the citizen. Absolutely. Yeah, right. absolutely. So uh, we successfully, uh, the General Assembly successfully held off on passing anything, which is quite surprising to me here based upon their uh, how they behaved the last six or so years. But uh, what do you see going forward in the, in the next regular session? Will some of this be carried into that? Well, you know, there were way over 100 bills introduced in the special session. I mean, it just became unlike what you typically see where a special session has a specific agenda. Like, for example, when they decided to give a billion dollars to Ford to build the electric vehicle plant in West Tennessee or things like that. This one was was basically public safety. And so you had this wild spectrum of bills uh, that were introduced that were proposed to be heard, resolved, and passed within a span of four to five days. And we anticipate that even though we stopped the real damage from being done in the special session, that it was just a, a you know, a warm-up opportunity and that we're going to see most of this legislation reintroduced come January of 2024. All right. So uh, what, if you could tell the listeners to the program, what do we need to do prior to the regular session coming, you know, convening? Well, the first thing I think listeners need to understand is we, we now have clear evidence that we've got a individual who identifies as a Republican that supports gun control in Tennessee. He's trying to turn a red state Tennessee into a red flag state. And if you look at the proclamation, it has a number of other problems in it that, you know, all indicate a willingness to implement a variety of control mechanisms, gun control and others, that are all designed to appease those who say there's a place in this world, notwithstanding the Second Amendment, for reasonable gun control. And so he's clearly on that path. He's pushing that agenda. He sides more with Justin Jones than he does with the true conservative Republicans that we do have in the legislature. And so for two more years, we're going to have this governor. We're stuck with it. We're stuck with his administration. And so we've got to figure out and, and realize that we've got a real and present danger with him in office. And, and so we can't sit back and go, well, we defeated it in the special session because it's coming back. And they're going to take advantage of the fact that frequently some of the most damaging legislation that the General Assembly passes is not put out front and passed through open debate and discussion so that we, the citizens, 
have good notice of what's about to transpire, these things get filed with caption bills, they get put on the back burner, and then the last three or four weeks of session, when all this confusion's going on of rushing to get the budget done, they tee these things up and force them through when very frequently the public has no real knowledge of what's going to get introduced, how fast it's moving, or what the real consequences are. Absolutely. And with that, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back on the other side. All right, we're back with uh, Mr. John Harris here, and he's uh, talked about what just happened in the special session, the possibility of it happening again in the regular session. And like he's mentioned, and I mentioned before on this program a lot of times, the caption bills proposed in the General Assembly are catch-alls, and they're, I believe they're purposely put in that way so they can hide what they're doing to us, not for us, what the General Assembly is doing to us. So, John, what, what kind of special language or words in caption bills should we be looking out for? Well, that's a that's a tricky topic, and it takes some experience to get used to that practice. I mean, so, for example, there may be reasons to file a caption bill because you need to open up a part of the code to propose some legislation, but for whatever reason, the the the, the legislation just isn't ready to be filed. And I can understand that. That's a practical problem with limited staff and limited resources in the General Assembly when you've got 132 legislators all wanting to get their bills done basically at the same time. So one thing that could be done with caption bills, for example, is to put a provision out there that if you do file a caption bill and you file an amendment that deletes and rewrites the entire bill, that that amendment has to be published on the state's website for at least, say, 14 days before they can even move it through the committees. you got to have reasonable notice of what the proposal is. They don't do that. I mean, like with the governor's permitless carry law in 2021, we knew some kind of amendment was coming. We didn't get a chance to see the amendment until it was filed and presented the day that it was heard in the committee. That's sandbagging the public, and that ought to be condemned but they get away with it. The other thing that really goes back to your question is, what does a caption bill look like? Typically, a caption bill is a very short bill that will do something like extending a window of time during which something has to occur, like extending a reporting period from 15 to 30 days. Or there was one a few years ago that was going to change the number of square inches of hunter orange that had to be on you know, a, a deer hunter's orange vest so they're, they're very typically when they're introduced they're they're a, a single paragraph maybe just two or three paragraphs they seem to do something very innocuous or you scratching your head and going why are we even bothering with this <laughs> but then when you look at the caption bill and then you look at um the caption of the uh, descriptive term up in the right hand corner on the first page of the bill they put a little blurb in there that says we're opening up this part of the code. And so when you see something that says, for example, with respect to firearms, that they're opening up Title 30, uh, 39, but they don't identify a specific chapter, like 39, 17, 1307, they just say Title 39. What that tells you is they're trying to open up that entire part of the code to do anything they want to do to it. And you have really no notice of what that is until they put the amendment in. That's where the real danger comes with these caption bills is you've got very broad uh, indicators of what part of the sta existing statutes are being opened. But then the body of the bill that they've given as a placeholder seems very innocuous. And, and that's where we have this sandbagging effect where they, you know, they introduce something that, that we think is irrelevant or harmless. And then all of a sudden it becomes the vehicle for a Trojan horse. Right. They want us to not pay. It. These aren't the droids you're looking for type of scenario. Absolutely. Right? And matter of fact, if you're if you're trying to identify legislation to follow and you're doing it with word searches, like you're searching for the word handgun, uh, you may never find those bills. If you're just doing a word search for bills that affect handgun or rifles or shotguns, if you're searching for a particular phrase, those caption bills frequently won't even show up. Right. So it's. It's just government not fulfilling their state or 
the purpose of government is to secure the people's liberty. And what they're doing with those bills, they're they're circumventing the people's liberty. Most importantly, they're doing it non-transparently. And transparency is a big part of the issue. Right. And I think I think uh, the House has a big problem with that, especially with the way that we record votes uh, in committees. They don't record them. It's just a it's a voice vote only. And I think that has given them license to uh, to behave this way. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, in, in the Senate, uh, with very few exceptions, all of the votes on a bill are recorded. So you know exactly how the senators are voting, even if it's in the committees. In the House, they typically operate on voice votes, which is totally at the discretion of the chairman. So they could, regardless of what the actual votes are, they could just declare based upon their ears that day that the A's or the nays won it. And then the problem is there's actually a provision in the rules where you can ask for a recorded vote in the House on a bill. And, and my understanding is that legislators are admonished. Don't do that. Don't force your peers to be on the record on bills that they want to vote against in these committees. And the big question is, why not? Why, why even be up there and vote if you don't want your vote to be publicly recorded as this is what you stood for or against? And clearly the House leadership, the leadership in the General Assembly, but particularly in the House, could change this voice vote situation and do away with it so that they're recorded votes, so that we know who's voting on our issues the way we want them to vote on it. And yet leadership wants to conceal that information and hide that information, and that's for one reason. That's incumbency protection. It's not because it takes more time or costs more money. They're trying to protect their incumbents. Right, and I think uh, that would be one of the biggest tools going forward that would ensure that the Republican supermajority actually behaves like a Republican supermajority if they're held accountable based upon their votes. But they, they hide behind the fact that they, they're they not recorded. So absolutely. And then you got to look well, that, at That's true. And, and I, for example, if you look on our website and search for uh, the, there's a legislator that's deceased now. His name is Jim Coley, C-O-L-E-Y. We actually have a video of Coley uh, several years ago now where he was the chairman of a House committee. He, he There were four members on the committee, uh, uh, six members rather, four Republicans and two Democrats. There was a voice vote and he called it out as the vote failed. It was a bill, if I recall correctly, by Micah Van Huss. It was a gun bill. And he called out the voice vote as failing, killed the bill. And then, curiously enough, he told one reporter after the fact that it was a four to two vote, four no's and two yeses, which meant two Republicans voted no on the bill. We know who they were. It turned out that there were Jim Coley and John Lundberg voted no on the bill with the two Democrats. And, and when Coley was interviewed, there was a videotape running. We've got the video. He and Lundberg told the House clerk to record their votes on that bill, which had been reported initially as four to two, as present not voting. So his instructions were to record the vote as two yeses, two noes, and two present not voting. And when Coley was asked on this interview after the fact, why'd you do that? He point blank told the reporter, I didn't want my constituents to know I voted against the gun bill. I mean, it's not just that they can't doing it. They're covering up deception by doing it the way they're doing it. Absolutely. So I think that's a, the next crop that gets in there in 2024. Uh, they need to change the way the house conducts business, especially in these committees and subcommittees where, where most good legislation goes to die and where it's most bad legislation, regardless of how the votes go, is advanced. So, yeah. and with that, we'll let's take another quick break, and then we'll be back uh, with a summation of what we need to do going forward to actually get constitutional carry in the state of Tennessee, and specifically how uh, our state's constitution violates the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. And with that, we'll be right back. All right, folks, we're back with uh, Mr. John Harris here, a great American, great patriot. He's going to 
It's going to sum, summarize what we need to do here in the state of Tennessee to actually get constitutional carry and, and do away with Governor Bill Lee's permitless carry, which which does pose some problems to people that are unaware of it, that they could actually be committing a felony and then having their Second Amendment rights completely done away with. So, John, if you go forward with what we actually need to do here in Tennessee. Well, the first thing is, I think people really need to understand that Tennessee does not have constitutional carry. Bill Lee said we did. House and Senate members have told us that we have constitutional carry. We do not. Constitutional carry is a, is a system where it simply is not a crime for someone who can lawfully possess a firearm to carry that firearm in public. That's constitutional carry. Tennessee doesn't have that. Tennessee has a statutory structure where it is presumptively a crime for an individual to carry a firearm or a club used to include a knife, but that got stripped out years ago. So it's presumptively a crime to carry a firearm or a club with the intent to go armed. That law, that crime has no geographic limits, has no time constraints. So for example, one of the affirmative defenses to that crime is that you were in your own home or that you were on your own property or that you have a permit or now that you are in compliance with the conditions for the permitless carry statute. And the consequence of that is by making it a crime subject to affirmative defenses, anytime an officer sees someone carrying a firearm or suspects him to be carrying a firearm, that officer has probable cause to believe a crime has been committed. That officer has legal authority to stop, detain, question, charge, or arrest them. Because under Tennessee law, an officer is not required in making a decision to charge or arrest to consider the availability or the strength of affirmative defenses. And quite clearly in Tennessee, this issue of I'm in my own home, I'm on my own property, I have a permit, are classified as affirmative defenses. They're the burden of the citizen to raise at the appropriate time. And by law in Tennessee, the only time that that defense has to be evaluated, by law must be evaluated, is when you're in front of a jury. Now, the officer or the district attorney could, could consider it as to the strength of their case and whether or not to move forward with prosecution, but they're not required to consider it. So literally, even if you've got a valid permit, you could be charged and have to hire an attorney and deal with the burden of the criminal justice system only to get acquitted by showing the jury you had a valid permit. And that's wrong. That's the way the law is. The Republicans in the General Assembly know that. They should know that. There's no excuse for not knowing that. And yet they've refused and failed for 14 years now to do anything about it. And all it would really do would be to amend that code to strike that phrase, right? With the intent to go armed. That's all you'd have to do is amend 39-17-1307A1. And there's no cost involved with that. Nothing that they, you know, usually the defense is, hey, this is going to cost too much. But the way the code's written really makes carrying a firearm, the permitless carry and the carrying of a firearm, a privilege and not a right, right? Because you have to defend yourself. Well, oh, not just permitless. I mean, even if you've got a permit, right? You, it, they, they treat it as presumptively illegal activity, and it gives them the ability to stop, detain, arrest, and question you almost for no reason at all other than you were doing something that the Second Amendment says you've got a right to do. Right. And like I said, if that's in our code, that means carrying a firearm is a, is a privilege that the state could take away that you have to defend with an affirmative defense to get, get your right back. It's not well, right that, if you if you have to ask permission. That that's a good way of putting it. But I'd go further and, and say it, it is a constitutionally protected right that the state's taken away anyhow. Right. You know we don't even get to the privilege issue. That's driving a car. This is a constitutionally protected right. It's no question that it's a constitutionally protected right, and yet the state thumbs its nose. And when I say the state, I mean the governor and the general assembly. Right. And the governor's using our tax dollars to pay his staff to lobby the the General Assembly to pass this. So he's using our own money against us. He is, absolutely. One of the most regular advocates against the Second Amendment in the Tennessee General Assembly is the Tennessee Department of Safety, and second to that, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. All of which are paid for with our tax dollars. Absolutely, and they're all under the direct control of uh, Governor Lee. <laughs> absolutely. So uh, we've got a little bit of time. Look, what do you think about this recent ATF decision about the brace rule? You know, the brace rule is is trickling its way through the courts right now. Uh, it will end up most likely at a federal appellate court level. Uh, and, and I think in some point in time, it'll end up 
in front of the U.S. Supreme Court again. And it's going to be a Bruin issue is what it's going to end up being, is the question under the Supreme Court decision in Bruin from June of 2022 is, does the federal government have the constitutional authority to uh, administratively redefine something to be one type of weapon when the statutory definition that Congress put in place classifies it as something different? That's what happened with the brace rule. Right. That's what happened with uh, the uh, the uh, bump stocks, even. Right. ATF is just making this crap up because they can get away with it. And until Bruin came about, there really weren't a good number of uh, courts that were willing to take a look at this and go, wait a minute. Not only is the rule potentially unconstitutional, but even is the statute itself that forms the basis for saying civilians can't own short barrel rifles without paying a tax. Is that even going to be constitutional? So Bruin is opening up a tremendous amount of area for litigation. I mean, I've got cases pending now in Tennessee, North Dakota, and Florida, uh, where I'm representing petitioners trying to strike down various parts of the Gun Control Act. And, and I've got friends with Gun Owners of America and other national organizations, mainly GOAs who I affiliate with, Right. that are fighting these issues all across the country. GOA. <laughs> GOA, that's right. Absolutely. Well, John, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the program today, and uh, I'm definitely going to ask that you come back on once the uh, General Assembly reconvenes in August, So, because you'll probably have a better idea of what to, the, the average citizen here in Tennessee should be paying attention to and contacting their representatives about pro or con about what's going on especially with the the recently adjourned special session that all that stuff is going to be now moved into the regular order and people are just going to be, you know, people are people. We're not going to pay attention to the government and what they're, again, what they do to us. And we, will, us. we will know by about the beginning of February what the bill package is going to look like for next year. Uh, the question mark is going to be those caption bills and whether or not we can ferret them out and how soon they surface. Um, I would tell your listeners if they're not already on the TFA's email list to get updates about this stuff, the email list itself is free. You don't have to be a member. Go get on that list. One of the best things they can do is just be informed and have a good source of information for what's going on in Tennessee. And we try to provide that to everybody at no cost. The other thing that we're going to be expanding this year in 2024 that we started up this year is we've subscribed to a service. It's pretty expensive. So if they want to help us offset the cost, that'd be great. But it lets us create letter writing campaigns where we can give them a template of an email that goes to their legislators or their committee members or the governor and say, you know, there's a bill running. Here's the bill number on, say, for example, red flag laws. And we oppose that. Now, we typically, the way we implement it, we'll, we'll draft a sample of an email body but we leave it so that the individual user can edit it any way they want. Uh, and then they can send those emails and we provide that as a service at no additional cost. So you don't even have to be a member, just be on, be on our email list and you can use that even. Absolutely. Well, so tell the listeners where they can go to get on this email list. Yeah, sure. Go to TennesseeFirearms.com. It's Tennessee Firearms with Tennessee all spelled out.com. And anywhere on that website, there'll be a column on the right-hand side. And at the top of that column, it are the buttons for subscribe, join, and donate. Uh, donate's only for members. But subscribe, join, or donate. You hit that subscribe button, it'll put you right on our email list. All right, thanks, John. Again, this is John Harris with the Tennessee Firearms Association, the Executive Director, a great American patriot, who is a staunch defender of our constitutionally protected rights. And we'll be sure to keep the audience informed of uh, things going forward. And with that, I'm going to sign off. John, appreciate you taking the time to stop by today. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it very much. And with that, folks, that's all the time I have for this week's episode. In closing, we have this week's wisdom from God's word. And today it comes to us from Psalms 144.1. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hand for war and my fingers for battle. Our government, both at the state and federal level, wants you to be unprepared for war especially for the war they wage against our constitutionally protected rights. Despite recent court victories in Texas and California, and even at the Supreme Court, this battle will never end. 
Thomas Paine once said, quote, government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, an intolerable one, unquote. Our government that constantly works at taking away our rights is an intolerable one. How long will you continue to tolerate their behavior and sit on the sidelines? You can join me in my fight to restore our government to one that operates within its constitutional guardrails. Once again, thank you all for listening, and I pray you all enjoy the week. Resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Until next week, stand in the arena with me. Reveille, it's time to wake up.